Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Lower Costs, Improved Outcomes, and Enhanced Experience. Activation is the key to changing health behaviors. Before we begin, I want to go over a few bits of webinar business. This webinar is being recorded. We will email the recording out to all of our registrants within 24 hours. At the end of the webinar, we will do a Q&A using the most frequently asked questions that we receive. But we will also have members of the Frisia team standing by to directly answer any of your questions. So just type your question into the Q&A box on the presentation console at any point during the presentation. If for some reason we don't get to your question today, we will follow up with an answer by email. And now I'll turn it over to Frisia's Chief Clinical Officer, Dr. Hillary Hatch, to get us started. Dr. Hatch, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kennedy, and thank you to our audience for joining us for this webinar. We are really thrilled to be bringing you this webinar today. Um, we're going to start with defining patient activation, do, which we're, by which we really mean do our patients have the knowledge, skills, and confidence to do their part in managing their care? Navigating our complex healthcare system is challenging for the most activated patient. Um, I think our panelists today will help us really understand how they're using patient activation to help patients and members navigate their healthcare. We asked three thought leaders from organizations that are using the patient activation measure, a survey platform that assesses individuals' knowledge, skills, and confidence to join us on a panel to share what they've learned, their successes, the impact they have seen, and also some of the challenges they face or future goals they have for their programs. We have with us today, Christy Bond, the Director of Population Health and Quality Improvement at Krauss Health Network, Kathy Olson, the former VP of Healthcare Services at Molina of Washington, and Carrie Ruthig, Director of Disease Management and Wellness at American Health Holding. So uh, for our thank you all for joining us. And for our agenda today, we'll start with a quick overview of the PAM, patient activation measure, that our panelists are using. We'll hear from our panel how they are innovating using PAM in their programs, real-world applications uh, with their patient and member population, and we'll end with a Q&A. So starting with a little bit of background information about the patient activation member, with 750 or more peer-reviewed studies, it has really become the gold standard in measuring patient activation. It is a way to understand an individual's self-management capabilities, and it is used, it is endorsed by NQF and used in several Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMMI programs, and we'll go into a little more detail about that today. PAM assesses the um, knowledge, skills, and confidence, which I've already mentioned, which are the key domains found to really govern health behaviors that lead to um, what we then see can predict costs and utilization, outcomes, and patient experience. What's been really important in understanding PAM over across the research is that it's malleable. So with intervention, PAM, can, PAM scores can change which means that there's the opportunity as those scores or as a patient, more importantly, or a member becomes more activated, that we see the associated and expected changes in their utilization, in their costs, and in their outcomes, in their health. So PAM can and is often used as a measure of risk. What, what is the risk that this patient just isn't going to be able to do their part in the care process? And that is an area of risk that's often sort of undermeasured or accounted for. And I think our panelists today are gonna to give us really good examples of that. Here's some, a few key areas that we've looked at. ED visits, hospitalizations, expected savings per member, or um, their increase in their overall healthcare satisfaction. So um, a few uh, notes on the programs that PAM has started to be used. And PAM has been used by many organizations all over the world for more than a decade. The tool has been around for almost two decades. And um, it has been used often in the following scenarios. It's, it's administered, um, patients are sort of uh, grouped into various levels um, across a hundred point um, scale and then put into three, uh, four groups, sorry. So levels one and two are the lower activated patients. Levels three and four are more highly activated patients. 
And by, by grouping people this way, it is often a way that interventions um, can be tailored to meet the patient where they are, a goal of so many organizations, and where resources can be focused to the members who need it the most. Let me talk for a second about the programs that um, Pam has been introduced into, um, which uh, with CMMI, the Kidney Care Choices Program and the Maternal Opioid Misuse Program. They're the first two models to require the use of Pam at the federal level, but it's been required in state programs, and one of our participants on the panel will talk about that. Um, in KCC, the aim is to reduce cost and improve the quality of care for Medicaid patients with late-stage CKD and in um, end-stage renal disease. Um, and in MOM, it's being used uh, by, um, by participants in the program that are uh, at risk for opioid use. So um, I think that's it for the background, and I'd really like to just jump straight into to our panel discussion and hear from uh, folks who have been using PAM for quite some time and have a lot of experience in uh, with the data, the application, and what they've learned from PAM. So uh, let me start with Carrie. Tell me about your organization, your role, and the, the um, members that you serve. Thank you. Um, so um, my company is American Health Holding, and we are a national medical management company. Um, we are URAC accredited. And uh, we are a part of Aetna, um, which is also owned by CVS Health. So we're an independent um, subsidiary of CVS Health. The main clients that we service are third-party administrators or TPAs. And all of the groups that we um, work with are self-funded. Um, we currently service over 3.1 million member lives. And um, the core products that we offer to our clients are utilization management, case management, and disease management. And personally, I oversee um, our disease management product. And we do have a small um, segment of business that does wellness. So I do also oversee wellness. Wonderful. Um it would be great if you can just tell us the history of how you've been working with Pam in your program. Sure. Um, we've actually been working with Pam for many years, um, since 2009. Um, I've personally been working with it since um, 2011, so lots of history here. Um, we utilize the Pam specifically with our disease management program. Um, so within disease management, we have um, nine chronic conditions that we're managing, and the PAM is the foundation of that coaching um, that we do for those members. So once a member decides that they want to engage with us and enroll in our program, um, we administer the PAM um, at, right there at enrollment, um, and then we stratify that member based on the PAM. Um, so our call frequencies, the type of goals that we guide them into choosing. Um, we utilize the coaching for activation and flourish tools um, that are also incorporated with the activation level. And it really helps us tailor coaching um, to that member. Um, so, so to give an example, um, if you were to look at, it, for example, a diabetic, because they're easy to kind of explain and understand, um, a, a level one diabetic um, is going to need a little bit more hand-holding. Um, I always say that they're the diabetic that says they've got a little sugar problem. You know, they might not say they have diabetes. Um, they don't have a lot of knowledge about what their blood sugars mean. They might not even be testing them very regularly or even know that they should be testing them regularly. Um, so those are individuals where when we do the call frequency, we want to reach out very frequently to them. So, you know, maybe once a month, we're going to reach out to them and talk to them. Um, where there's also on the other end of the spectrum, there's going to be the level four diabetic. Um, and a level four is someone that, you know, may have had diabetes their entire life. You know, they might be a type one diabetic and had it since child childhood and know a lot about diabetes. Um, so they don't need us to be very simple. Um, they can have more complex conversations about um, their condition, and we might not have to reach out to them as frequently. So maybe once a quarter, 
you know, we're going to reach out to them, but we still feel it's important in our program to reach out to them because life happens. And, you know, while they may know and have all the knowledge, they may not be um, doing it often and as much as they should. So we, we touch base with them. Um, and then every six months we do reevaluate. Um, so we want to make sure that we're constantly reassessing individuals in our program and where they're at with the PAM. Um, so every six months we'll reevaluate and see where they're at. And then again, like I said, the frequency of the calls and um, the timing of those calls are, are really all around um, that PAM level. So with the level, it's just for, for folks that are relatively new to this. So level yeah. one is the least activated and level four, the most activated. You're really sort of painting a picture of a level one. You're really just trying to sort of uh, create awareness of their condition and sort of a sense of um, really um, making it more central to them and, and, and getting them started, sort of knowing where to start. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And with those level ones, um, they can get overwhelmed very easily. So if you were, let's say we didn't do the PAM and we don't know their level and you start talking about um, you know, blood sugars and their glucometer and all these things, and they're and they just don't even understand that basic knowledge. You, you're you're going to lose them as far as education. So you need to make sure that knowing that level can help you keep it more simplistic and and meet the member where they're at and where they can actually engage with you and get benefit from the program. Thank you. That's that's really helpful, and I think um, uh, sort of a nice lead in to talking about how. How is using PAM data different from using claims or pharmacy data? What, what, how have you found it's really um, informed your process to add patient activation data? Yeah, um, great question, of course. Um, so we do use pharmacy and medical claims data in our program, as you know, all disease management programs generally do. Um, we focus on identification with the pharmacy and medical claims data. So anybody that has one of the nine conditions that we manage, we're going to identify them. Now, now, some disease management companies, what they'll do is they take it a step further from there and they'll stratify the member based on the claims experience and say, you know, we're going to cast our net to only capture the high risk population, or maybe there's an opportunity score that they're, they're gathering from claims where we have an opportunity to reach out to this member and impact them. So what we feel is that, you know, we wanna make sure that every single individual that has a condition has the opportunity to engage, um, no matter if they're considered high risk or in a high opportunity or whatnot, because we feel the value is really in the PAM and their level. So we call everybody to try try and engage them. And then once they engage with us, giving them the PAM assessment and understanding where they're at with activation, we feel is way more valuable because that level one um, PAM individual, you know, might not show up in your um, other analysis that you're doing with claims. So it's, it's really allowing us to, to pinpoint our coaching to those individuals and meet them where they're at. So, uh if I understand it right, you, you use the claims and pharmacy data to identify your target population, but it's PAM that informs how you coach them and how frequently the types of coaching, the kind of goals you set with them, it really changes from that perspective. Um, For sure. Yes. I, th I think that's great. You know, I, I think folks listening to this are probably looking at these numbers on the slide and thinking, when are we going to get to that? So can you talk about how have you have used PAM to, to, and how you've evaluated the cost effectiveness of this program, what you've seen as results? Sure. Um, so I, one of the, I think the, the best conversation is around the actual cost savings. So I'm going to start from the bottom of the slide, if that's okay, where it talks about um, under the results, the 3,346 average savings per managed member. So we have two different ways of, of talking about cost savings and cost savings analysis that we do. Um, we have a claims-based version where we actually look at the claims experience for members that are participants and not participants. And then 
you know, can can match up those non participants with a participant that as the same demographic, you know, diabetics to diabetics and so forth. And then we can actually do this very detailed, you know, claims methodology analysis around that by doing this matching. And that's what we did when we actually did the $3,346 of average savings. It's, it's all based on the claims analysis that we do with our methodology. The drawbacks of that was that you know, you, we needed at least 100 engaged members to do the matching to have that good sample size, um, which when you look at your book of business, you may have clients that don't have 100 people engaged in the program. So we needed to also solve for those individuals that needed some sort of projected cost savings and value of the program. Um, so we developed our second um, cost savings tool that we have, which is the PAM-based cost savings analysis. So with our PAM-based cost savings analysis, that basically is using research. And the research tells us that for every uh, four points that you increase that PAM score, it equates to $156 of monthly cost savings. Um, so utilizing that, that um, research, we then created this PAM-based cost savings analysis that showed for those members that even if, or those groups that even if they just have one member that's engaged, as long as they have a baseline PAM and a comparative PAM, we can actually do an analysis for them to show projected cost savings. But we took it a step further because of course, you know, it's based on research. You know, we wanted to be able to, to kind of feel confident that it was gonna be a, a good number um, that we were sharing with our clients. So we did very detailed studies um, with using our claims-based process and methodology compared to the actual PAMS base and analysis. And we found that they're very, very close. Um, so close that our business intelligence team um, are very confident that our go-to cost savings methodology and analysis that we do for clients is the PAM-based PAM version. Um, and we really only use the claims-based version um, when we have, you know, a very large client that we could have a good sample size and, and they'd like us to do it, or when we're analyzing our book of business. Um, but again, the, the comparison between the two is very, very similar. And we actually find that the PAM-based cost savings that we, that we do is a little conservative. So we never feel like we're overstating anything. Um, so I, I think that's one of the key takeaways is that, you know, we do have a, a good analysis based on that research. Well, I really feel you've already answered this, but um, uh, uh, is there anything more you want to say about how you convey value to the payers organizations you work with that you didn't capture on that? Because I feel like you captured a lot of it already. Yeah. I mean, and truly when, um, so when I have a client that comes to me and says, you know, we have disease management, I need you to show me the value. Um, the, the PAM, the PAM based cost savings analysis is my go-to. It's my talking points. And the biggest thing with that, that I can show is, you know, you get, you get one person, even just one person engaged and you move that PAM score, look at what you could experience and realize with, with the savings, then the conversation can turn to how do we get members engaged? <laughs> like, how do we, how do we get them to engage so that we can experience that savings? That's great. Um, any challenges you're facing now or sort of goals for the future that you could share? Yeah, honestly, the, the biggest challenge that we do have is engagement, which I think anybody that has a disease management program faces that nowadays. So um, a lot of our effort is really around um, engagement and uh, different modalities for engagement and, and getting our clients to help to work more in partnership with us to help increase that engagement number. Um, so I, that's really our focus. We, we feel like the, the foundation of the program itself is where it needs to be. You know, the PAM works great, coaching for activation, the tools, and all of our clinical components um, are, are, are all good. It's a great program. We just need the members to engage. Yeah. I, I, and in a minute, we'll talk about um, a care management program within a health system context, and we can talk about some of the differences and challenges you face when you're trying to get um, the member contact through a plan and how that might be different. Is there anything that you would say to, to a group that is interested in achieving the same successes about where they should start? 
I think my recommendation is, um, you know, if, if you're if you're thinking about utilizing the PAM as a tool, I think it's going to um, be a great tool, but it's important to understand it. So, you know, it's more than just getting the measurement and knowing this individual is a level one or this individual is a level four. It's really understanding um, that knowing that gives you the power to adjust how you're um, addressing that individual, how you coach that individual and how you relay information to that individual. I think that's the key is that, you know, understanding the levels and utilizing it to the, the way that it was designed um, to do that education. So that, that would be, I think, the, the key to success. Thanks so much for your comments. I wonder if Christy or Cassie have any specific questions for you before we we jump to hearing about another organization's work. Kathy, Christy, any specific questions? I think in my wildest dreams, I'd love to have a PAM on everybody before we start working with them. So I knew exactly, you know, how many resources to, um, to devote to, you know, that patient. You know, I don't want to overwhelm with too many contacts that are not really needed. And yet I, I want to make sure I devote enough resources. So how do you work that into your process to have the PAM assessment before you even, you know, start engaging with your members? Oops, sorry. So we actually um, don't administer the PAM until someone engages. So, so that we, that's part of our enrollment process. So once they do engage in the program, then we're giving the PAM and then we have the resources. And then um, our call frequency really allows us for staffing, right? And, you know, not everybody's a level four and level fours don't need as much high touch, you know, so our level ones and twos are where we spend the majority of our time in the high touch on. So it allows us to um, have a staffing model that's not too overwhelming for, you know, with costs and, and so forth as well. So being able to manage the different levels with the call frequencies. That's, that's great. Um, Christy, I think you'll share some, probably share some things and have some differences. So let's, let's talk about your organization and, um, it would be great if you could, you know, just give more of an introduction of your, your organization, your role and, um, and the, the patients that you serve. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I, um, am the director of population health for um, the Krauss Health Network and our population health infrastructure uh, serves 27 uh, practices, um, about uh, 250, the patients of about 250 providers. And those providers are involved in uh, accountable care and value-based arrangements. So in our accountable care organization, we have about uh, 9,000 uh, patients and in uh, some other value-based payment payment arrangements, it's about another 15,000 uh, patients. So that's, that's the patient population that we're trying our best to, to manage. And um, the cornerstone of what we do is care management. So I have about 30 care managers that uh, work with patients of all uh, PAM levels and we uh, do the PAM, the PAM assessment is, you know, foundational, uh, just like we've been talking about. We do that at the beginning of our engagement with a patient and then uh, try to repeat it uh, so that we get a sense of uh, where the patient is uh, at various time points along our journey together. That's great. You know, I'm going to put a pin in the, in the thought about where in the journey it's best to because I think I'll ask you all of that together at the end, but I think it seems like something that um, folks share your desire. It would just be great to have them on the whole population and then sort of know wh where you're at. Um, what Talk about how you use PAM in, in your program and specific examples of how a nurse might engage a patient differently with a low PAM score versus a high PAM score. Yeah, we, um, we do the PAM assessment with patients um, upon, uh, you know, our beginning our work together so that we know we can really individualize our intervention with that patient. 
Uh, so we always try to follow the patient's lead. And this is one of the ways we can follow the lead. We can find out exactly how knowledgeable they feel and how confident they feel in managing their own health care. So we do it right at the very beginning. And, uh, you know, patients that are uh, lower activated, we just try to take things really slowly. You know, um, I'll never forget uh, attending a, a class, a COPD class at a hospital that I was working at. And, you know, when you're just providing education, you tend to just provide the same education to everybody across the board. And this respiratory therapist came in and she was giving, you know, all the anatomy and physiology with the, the lungs. And I'll never forget this one woman opened her purse, like cut the education right off, opened her purse, pulled out an inhaler and said, I just want to know how to use this. And so she, that's where she was. That's what she wanted to know. So we use the PAM to try to figure out, okay, where are you right now? What, what do you really want to know? Um, and how can we be most helpful? Because if you don't do that, you're, you're not going anywhere with that patient. You told me um, a story when we've talked before about the change that this can be for nurses who have that sort of kind of education model. Um, the ch- the shift in teaching them to start where w- to sort of define start where the patient is, which we would all say, of course we should do that. But what does that actually really mean? Um, you gave the example, I think, of a CHF patient um, and try post discharge and trying to get them to sort of recreate like what led them to be in the hospital. Can you? You'll say it better than I can, so I'd love it. If oh yeah, oh, I'm happy to. I you know I think about. Um, care management in the hospital and you have that patient for just a short period of time. So on the way out, you're trying to give them all the information about their CHF diagnosis. You're trying to tell them, you know, don't, you know, watch your salt, weigh yourself every day, watch for swelling. Um, you know, all, all these things you're trying to tell them to do and the patient is just kind of, you know, overwhelmed and they want to get the heck out of there and, you know, um, not uh, much is happening that's positive in that interaction. But what our nurses have the luxury to do is we can talk to patients after that hospitalization. And we typically start by asking the patient, do you remember um, when you went to, into the hospital, what brought you there? Um, how were you feeling? Um, what made you know that you had to um, you know, engage with uh, the hospital and, or you know, head off to the emergency department? And so then we can use that information to, to build upon it. You know, remember how you were feeling that meant you were having an exacerbation of your CHF. And let's talk about what that means and what you want to do when that happens. Yeah. The way you talked about it reminded me so much of how Carrie talked about awareness, just, just getting that awareness. So you said, and I, and I found it sort of moving. You were just trying to get the patient to identify a feeling that they could remember a feeling that was, that they're trying to avoid. And, and mm-hmm. keep it sort of basic like that, um, rather than try and talk to them sort of over in a, in a kind of intellectual way about their illness. Um, and of course, as a psychologist, that really resonates for me. So I think that's great. Um, what, what challenges have you experienced in activating patients for their health? Well, I think it's a, I think it's a change uh, for nurses because, you know, as nurses, we we learn about patient education and very often in the various settings we deliver patient education, it's, you know, me talking at the patient, you know, and delivering information. And this is a whole new way of doing things. This is finding out, okay, where are your pain points? Where are the areas that you feel um, you're not uh, terribly confident or terribly knowledgeable? And the PAM assessment, really helps you do that because it's all the items are ranked and get progressively tougher to say yes to, to strongly agree to. So it's, it's easy to identify, you know, wherever the patient starts saying anything other than strongly agree, you can identify, okay, that's a great place to start. Let me, let me start there and let me start really small and start asking some questions about, you know, let's say the first place is managing your medication. So let me start asking you some questions about how you do that. You know, what, what, how do you know what you're supposed to take? What are you taking? Why are you taking it? 
those kinds of things. And then that can lead you into, okay, let's talk about, you know, the various medications you're on and, and raise some uh, questions that the patient might have about, you know, side effects or when they're supposed to take something or, you know, things like that. Great. Yeah. I think that's really helpful to talk about some specific interventions that you can do using the survey. Um, you use it in the ACO and in chronic care management. Do you want to talk a little bit more how it fits into those programs? Yes. Um, and we, um, as I said, it would be great if we could have a PAM assessment on everybody. That would be a much better way to identify, uh, you know, who really needs us. But we, you know, much like we were talking about already, um, you know, we use claims data to identify patients who might, you know, um, benefit from having some support by a nurse. And then we, um, you know, we start with the, the uh, PAM assessment. So that's what we do in all our value-based payment arrangements. But we also um, bill the chronic care management uh, codes that are available through um, uh, the physician fee schedule uh, for CMS. And uh, that uh, gives us a way to fund our care management work. Um, and so it's an, it's an integral part of that chronic care management program, uh, because again, it gives us a way to individualize uh, the uh, care management intervention. In addition, it's one of our key quality metrics that I support, that I report to senior leadership and to payers, uh, to our ACO, uh, to show them that, you know, our care management uh, program is really having an impact. And the reason I do that is because anything else we track, you know, readmissions, ED visits, how much people cost, um, the, the solutions to that are multifactorial. So it's really hard for me to say, yep, care management did that, you know, but we, my care managers are the only people in the whole team that are working on activation. And so mm -hmm. if I can show data related to, to activation, I can say, yep, this is where my care managers contributed to that whole picture. And you're seeing significant improvements in activation and the end, how they're doing that. And we are, I think, yeah. um, anything you want to say about goals for the future before I bring in Kathy? Uh, well, you know, one of the goals uh, for the future is to, um, you know, make sure we're repeating those PAMs. We talked about it every six months. And it's been a struggle the last couple of years because when we work with patients, they want to talk about COVID. They want to talk about monkeypox. And so we've gotten a little derailed in the past couple of years uh, with repeating the PAM as, as often as we can. So that's, um, we're hoping now that we've, uh, we kind of know how to manage all of that. Um, and we can give folks some good, um, you know, good advice and guidance. We can get back to repeating the PAM uh, every six months. Thank you, Christy. I think it's very interesting to hear about it in the ACO context and across the health system. Um, Kathy, I think I, I would love for you to talk about how you came to PAM because it really is in a, a different point of entry in terms of the Washington State Medicaid program. So um, I, I would love for you to uh, give us sort of the background of, uh, of your organization and how PAM came to you and what your role was. Thanks. Sure, I'd be happy to and happy afternoon, everyone. Um, in, uh, in Washington, Molina uh, is the largest Medicaid plan in the state. We over we see over um, serve over a million members of Medicaid, Medicare, and marketplace um, individuals, and we serve within that million members about half of the Medicaid population. And back in 2012, uh, the state of Washington signed on to the federal. Um, health home program, and we started delivering health homes to our most vulnerable Medicaid uh, population. And because of that program, the PAM was one of the mandatory um, assessments. And so that's how we kind of jumped in and learned about PAM and everything about it. And through the use of PAM and applying it to the members in that program, 
we really saw the value of finding those most vulnerable, lower activated members quickly. So we adopted the program for the rest of our case management programs. And we have regional, we have regional teams across the state um, and each of those um, teams uh, using the reporting tools within um, the PAM assessment were able to compare their um, improvements in activation scores and um, the case managers were able to help each other um, learn how to engage those lower, more difficult uh, to engage members, so. Oops, I'm on mute. Um, and so uh, over time, you you expanded the population and, and I believe started um, using PAM as a part of your measuring effectiveness for NCQA programs. Can you tell us a little more about that? can. As an NCQA accredited um, Medicaid program, we needed to show that we had an effective case management uh, program, that we were making a difference. So we decided to use the, the change in PAM scores for level one and level two as part of the demonstration of that effectiveness. And we uh, worked with um, the program to determine what would be the appropriate level changes to demonstrate effectiveness and we set a target of eight points improvement for level one members and six point improvements for level two and then we worked with our teams and, and we applied the the reassessment uh, more frequently because with the medicaid population we found that they were um, harder to engage perhaps and didn't engage as long so we repeated the assessment every three months and every four months for our health home program was mandatory. And then quarterly re reported aggregate data on the, um, the changes in the PAM scores between those teams. And then again, annually, we were able to show um, in the several years that we were, um, we met the goals and were able to change those scores for our members. And uh, on, our, on our screen now, there's sort of a graphic here and I want you to explain it to everyone, what it means and how you used uh, claims-based risks tool and what you found when you looked at PAM data and the claims-based risk tool together. Sure. And I think this might sound familiar to what Carrie was saying. You know, uh, many companies use a risk stratification tool to identify people at risk for incurring um, unnecessary healthcare costs or at risk to, you know, have additional uh, costs or poor outcomes in health. And so our case managers would uh, receive referrals from the Molina um, risk stratification tool, but we also know that we receive referrals from many other sources, from members themselves, from providers or other ways. And by using and applying the PAM, when someone was first um, engaged in case management, we found additional members that were at risk and uh, could really benefit from case management services. And again, when you have a large population, you want to target your resources at the individuals you feel that need the most help, not always the ones that want the help that might be more already activated and willing to receive help. You really want to use your resources for the most vulnerable, most at-risk patients. And so by adding and using the PAM in addition to our claims-based risk tool, we really were able to identify more at-risk individuals and um, have our case managers engage with them. And that by saying you you identified more at risk individuals, I think you mean, but I want to be sure that those that were about to have more um, avoidable ED visits or avoidable admissions, but that wasn't showing up in the claims data that would have identified them. Right, you it was know, more predictive than retrospective. Correct. Sorry, you know, claims um, tools are great because they can look historically and predict for future events, but then somebody out of the blue can have a life-changing event and you get referred that person. And so it's those types of individuals you really want to know about and engage as early as possible. That's great. So um, I, I'm actually, I'm gonna ask you this question, but then I'm gonna try and sort of sum up what we're hearing from everyone about level one and level two um, uh, members and patients. Um, what are the specific interventions? Why is it important to focus on them? And what are the specific interventions you see that work? Right. So I let's think try and generate a list across all of them. Cause I, I heard frequency of contact as being sort of and small steps, uh, awareness. I, I think um, 
small, simple goals is probably what we found to be the most effective. I think, I think it was Christy that said, you know, nurses were taught to educate people and many of our case managers were nurses, but others were uh, professionals with behavioral health backgrounds. And they may approach an individual, you know, kind of with a, with a peanut butter approach, like here's the information and I'm going to give it to you, but that's not where people are. And that's really what I think the activation levels um, help the most is um, helping you know like where to bring the information to, like at what level, so people can digest that and make small, simple improvements. And when you help someone who isn't very activated, not engaged, really struggling to understand their condition, if you can help them make small incremental wins and small steps, then they start to build their confidence. And our hope over time was to have someone not need our case management services anymore to graduate them out so we could help the next person coming in. And that was, that really helped us kind of achieve some of those goals. Yeah, you know, um, Judy Hibbard, who authored the, the tool, um, told me a story from the interviews that she did trying to sort of identify these different groups. And she told me the story of a, a level one person that she was speaking to. And the person said, I don't like talking about my health. It makes me feel bad. And you think about, you know, trying to educate that person. And just as a psychologist, the, 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 the walls that come up and sort of shutting down when they just, it's making them feel bad. So how do you have a different kind of interaction where they're more likely to sort of have little experiences of success where they don't feel bad engaging with the healthcare system? Mm -hmm. um, and can build that confidence over time that they actually could be an effective manager of their health. Um, but uh, Carrie and Christy, jump in. What did, did we miss anything of sort of the, the, the most common strategies? I mean, I think if there's one word to identify or to, to, um, to describe a level one and level two, it's overwhelmed. And the healthcare system really hasn't worked for them, you know, for a lot of reasons. And so they're a little bit gun shy and they don't necessarily believe that um, things are going to get better, you know. And so I think that's why with a level one and level two, you want to take things slowly and celebrate some success along the way. And I think even just repeating the PAM assessment periodically helps you celebrate some of those wins with patients. So you celebrate them in a lot of ways, achieving goals or, you know, um, building confidence, feeling more positive, but also um, seeing improvement in those PAM scores can be a, a celebration. We never give patients our, the PAM score, but, um, you know, we might say to them, wow, you know, look, the last time you answered this question, you said disagree. And this time you said agree. You know, so we're, we're making progress here. Kathy, you brought up that um, sometimes level threes and fours, they, they make the nurse or the care manager feel good because they're very talkative and engaged and all that. And I think what we're saying, um, Christian, sort of that is that not only do ones and twos feel bad, sometimes those who work with them feel bad because they feel like they're not helping. And even just knowing it's not that I'm not helping. I just, I need to. I need to have better expectations of what we can accomplish. And just the person coming back again to see me is a big win, mm -hmm. but they didn't just disengage from the minute I called them. And so Carrie, I saw you go off mute. So I, I want to like, the, the only thing I was just going to add is that, you know, the whole conversation around um, the nurses that do this have to kind of take a whole different approach. It's, it's more of that active listening instead of like telling and having that conversation and education and picking out those little key things, um, you know, like hearing that talking about my health makes me feel bad. Well, there's a whole conversation right there that by hearing that, that you can just change the narrative um, right there. So I just think it's, it's very important. The one thing I wanted to add is just that whole active listening um, and, 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 and taking those small wins when it comes to the level ones. And I'm not sure, Carrie and Christy, if you experienced this too, but it was with definitely within the population, the Medicaid population, you know, there's so many other social determinant of health type of factors that 
influence someone's ability to manage their care and understand their care. And I always think of it as the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you don't have housing, if you don't have food, it's hard to concentrate on your diabetes or your CHF and things like that. But I think even using the PAM and identifying that people didn't even know how or couldn't apply for housing or couldn't, didn't know how to access food in their environment, our case managers were able to start and help with some of those basic needs and then over time work on more of the disease management kind of things. I'm not sure if that was your experience too. Yes, I, I think so. You know, wherever the patient is that, you know, that's where you have to start or, you know, you're never really going to get anywhere. They're not going to continue it to accept your services. The, the only one thing I was just going to add to that too, is just how do they prioritize their health? Um, so a lot of times you'll notice that people have priorities on different things. Um, you know, I've, I've, I had this conversation one time with, with a, a lady who said she couldn't afford her medications, but, you know, she would tell me about how she would take these trips and, you know, do all these other things. And it's just how she was prioritizing how she spent her money. Um, so that kind of was a different narrative too on, you know, how do you educate people that your health is a is a higher priority than than maybe some other needs. So that was something I found too. It's just you know how do they, um, you know those those individuals that may not have the means, um, you know, for housing and things like that. You know how to help them prioritize to know that you know how they can prioritize their health along with some of those other needs too. If that makes sense. I think a lot of groups are looking at how. Um, unmet social needs and, and unaddressed patient activation needs are sort of coming together. The healthcare system is, and the sort of get, getting benefits for those who are trying to, uh, in various ways, access resources is, is challenging for the most activated patients and um, really understanding how much more complex and harder all of those things get when someone um, doesn't feel like they they feel that overwhelmed, they're just they kind of feeling that they, they just aren't going to be able to do this. Or carry like your story of the person that feels like they don't um, that they, they're not prioritizing their medications. I just think someone like that just feels sort of like um, it isn't going to help me, or it's it's they're frustrated that the healthcare system isn't there to support them, and it's. It's more satisfying to go on a trip. It's more, you know, pleasing. Healthcare isn't exactly fun, you know. Right. Um, Kennedy, well, did think, we answer? Oh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think sometimes the um, some of the other assessments that you could use to decide whether you're going to work with somebody or to decide where they are, are often based on edge level or or uh, psychosocial level, and so sometimes we make assumptions about people who have um, social needs that perhaps they are low activated. And I haven't found that to be the case mm -mm. at all. You know, sometimes yeah. people who have social needs are, you know, frustrated in their attempts to manage their health for reasons that are completely unrelated to how knowledgeable they are or how committed they are to improving their health. Right. I think we have found them to be, um, there to be some overlap, but much more difference and across Medicaid populations to see so unmet social needs across the population, but a real difference in activation. Mm -hmm. um, and in every population, there's a distribution of activation, um, kind of, uh, you know, a fairly um, consistent distribution of activation of slightly different, but in, in certain uh, populations, especially Medicaid groups, are going to be unmet social needs across it. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, groups have help, found it helpful to look at both. Kennedy, I think actually that Christy answered one of the questions that you told me had come in, but are there about the difference in various assessment tools? And I, I would add the other difference, the key difference is that the patient activation measure has the ability to inform care in the moment. And I think so many tools are sort of after the fact or months later, just kind of judging the quality of care and not really being used to 
make care better. And I think that 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 and the abundant research uh, associated with it are really the key differentiators. But Kennedy, any other questions that came in that are burning? I know we're probably up against time almost. There's so much to talk about. We are, and uh, but I think you and our panelists in our conversation there at the end covered pretty much all of the frequently asked questions that we were going to go through. Um, so I think I think if we're there, I think I'm going to bring us to a close just because we are coming up against time. Um, and, and I'd like to tell our audience members, um, if you'd like to learn more about using PAM um, with your care management team and your health system or as part of your managed care services, please fill out the short form on your presentation console and a representative will reach out to you. Um, and thank you all again for joining us for our webinar, Lower Costs, Improved Outcomes and Enhanced Experience, Activation as the Key to Changing Health Behaviors. We hope you enjoyed it and picked up some great ideas that you can put into